Good morning, and this is the Propeller Club of Northern California, and welcome to you all. Uh, we have a networking meeting today, and uh, we're going to get a chance to talk to each other and uh, just check in with everybody. Uh, unfortunately, Congressman Garamendi could not make it, but his chief of staff, uh, Brad Bottoms, is going to join us. So um, as soon as Brad shows up, we'll uh, uh, bring him on. But uh, what I wanted to do at, in our first moment here is uh, some of you know that Andy Garcia, uh, GSC uh, uh, Logistics, died uh, last week. Uh, Andy was a, a leader in the trucking community um, and in the import uh, uh, dredge community. And he was a uh, leader in the fight on the Howard Terminal issue, which for those of you who are not familiar with the Port of Oakland, uh, the Oakland A's uh, have, have proposed a ballpark and condominium complex at Howard Terminal. And uh, most of the maritime community is opposed to it because they believe that it will undermine cargo handling and ultimately jeopardize the Port of Oakland. Uh, Andy uh, was a uh, trucking executive with GSC Logistics. He took a leading role. In, uh, he put together. Uh. Post now, I see. <laughs> well, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> We're going to do these breakout rooms too. And uh, oh, here I go. I've got the. Uh, now it finally came up because I'm the co-host, and I think it's because <laughs> we lost interconnection with Stas. But um, uh, I know that, and uh, John Garmandi was going to give a talk or his assistant, and I don't think he's here. So. Hey Todd, this is Bradley Bottoms with Congressman Garamundi. Sorry, oh, I was hi. misnamed in the beginning. Uh, <laughs> my scheduler's name was Tessa Brown instead of me. But oh, okay, um, yeah, nice I've been to meet you. nice to meet you as well. Well, you know, while Stas is trying to get back on the internet, uh, you could. Would you like to uh, go ahead and? Absolutely. Well, apologies for the congressman not being here. In the days of coronavirus, when your flight changes, there's not really a lot of options to get a direct. Uh, from DC to Sacramento. So he is currently on an airplane. So I'm sorry, but happy to fill in and meet with all of you. Um, last night was actually a great night for Maritime. We marked up the National Defense Authorization Act, um, the authorization for the entirety of the Department of Defense. The Congressman's the chair of the Readiness Subcommittee, which is a third of the Department of Defense budget. And one of the, actually two big provisions that you all might be interested in is we've locked down the um, the cargo preference for the Department of Defense. Before, they essentially could say if the price was slightly higher for American crews, they could go with someone else. Now it has to be a complete non-availability. So we think this is going to be huge for maritime. We're also creating, just like we have uh, the MSP fleet, we're creating a tanker security program. So anyone who's transporting crewed or um, other types of energy that the Department of Defense would use would be on American made and built or American built and crewed ships. So we're pretty excited about both of those provisions. Uh, the reason though that uh, Stoss asked me to join was we were very close this this close to getting the energizing American shipbuilding bill into HR2, the massive infrastructure bill um, that passed the floor to uh, yesterday, excuse me. Um, we had a couple jurisdictional issues, but we uh, brought up a, a lot of awareness on the bill. I think many of you know about it, but essentially it would say that a small percentage of LNG and crude exports per year have to be made or have to be sent on American built and American crude ships. So a huge boom, we think about 40 massive ships would be built in the next about 15 years. So be a big thing for the shipbuilding industry and obviously the crews as well. Um, we now have the chairman of all of the right committees on board, so we could really use any of your help with just raising awareness with your members of Congress so that way we can push it across the finish line. Um, with that, happy to take any questions on 
either of those, anything going on in Congress. I don't think I can explain to you what the president's doing these days, but I could try. Um, but happy to answer any questions. Do you have any questions? I've got a question. Uh, so th with the House's passage, uh, what are the expectations of uh, where the bill's going in the Senate? Uh, this is HR2 or? Yeah, HR2. So we will continue to say that we'll continue to put pressure on the Senate to do something. I don't think we can necessarily conference this bill because the Senate put together just a highway bill. Um, ours is their highway bill was about $200 billion over five years, which is essentially the status quo, which we think is unacceptable. Ours over that same time period is 500 billion. Um, so in theory, we could conference that provision, but we also did a rail title. We did an energy title um, that deals with uh, the transportation of energy across the country. Uh, we also did a huge broadband title, which maybe would help Stas's internet connection today. Um, which would invest $100 billion into broadband deployment across the country. Um, we did a housing and a schools title as well. So it's a much bigger bill, $200 billion versus $1.5 trillion. So right now, I don't see him passing it this year. The hope is, knock on wood, we win the Senate, and then we'd have full ring to, to do something similar or the exact same. Or maybe he just starts to feel the heat with the, the weathering economy. I mean, the chairman of the joint, of, excuse me, the wrong chairman, of um, the Federal Reserve System told us to think big. So this is us doing big and trying to do some real investment. So I think it's likely either we do it next year or there's a potential that he starts feeling the heat and the Senate takes something big up. Either way, we'll be sitting there with the energizing bill and try to put that in there too, because there there was some good things for ports in there, just not for the shipbuilding and shipping industry in particular. I see Stoss is back. Yeah, okay. Uh, can you just, uh, Bradley, thank you for zipping in like that. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I see you have your IT support with you. <laughs> I do. I have my IT person. If it hadn't been for her, this might have been a much more complicated uh, transaction. Uh, in any case, uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, have we done the introductions yet, Tom? Uh, no, we didn't. Uh, Bradley just went ahead because we were waiting for you to get back on uh, the okay. internet. So. So, so Bradley, um, if you will just sit tight, I'm going to ask everybody to, I'm going to actually, Todd, you have got the control screen because we're using Benitas. Can you um, see who's on and then we can introduce, I'll ask everybody to introduce. Okay, you want me to mute everyone? Uh, uh, why don't I you can, do- I can make you the co-host too here on can Benitas. You? Yeah, hang on a second. All right. There you go. Great. Okay, participants. Okay. Hold so on, hold on. make this a little bigger. All right. So you can see more people and then we'll move this over here. Okay, very good. So you can still see the main person. Thank you very much. I don't know what I'd do without my daughter. <laughs> there we go. Happy Fourth of July, everybody. Okay. Uh, so uh, I'm going to start by introducing, uh, well, you saw my daughter, Benita. Come over, Benita. Benita Margaronis is working with her father. Unfortunately. And she is doing a lot of uh, work in the office, and she's we're also doing a lot of mulching in the backyard. OK, say hi to everybody. Hi. Bye. <laughs> OK. Uh, Todd Crawshaw, our IT guy. Todd, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, our company is Crosha Design. We provide integrated brand marketing for print and web and uh, IT support for, for Stoss <laughs> and others. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Dean Oda, Dean, introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, my name is Dean. Uh, 
Uh, we, I'm an executive with a company called H2O Logistics. We're a, a mainland USA to Hawaii freight forwarding company. Thank nice you, Dean. Uh, and we have Captain Leroy Zerlang, hot from Humboldt Bay. Captain Zerlang, introduce yourself. Uh, good, uh, I guess it's still good morning, Leroy Zerlang. I'm from the big port of Humboldt Bay. I operate Zerling and Zerling Marine Services. We're a marine railway. We haul up to 300 tons. We have uh, small tugs. We're associated with Coos Bay Tug out of Coos Bay, Oregon. We're shipping uh, ship agents. We're marine surveyors. Uh, we operate the Harbor Cruise Boat Madiket if we could. Uh, we operate the Humboldt Bay Harbor District's fire boat. We do a little bit of everything, and uh, we love Stas. <laughs> Leroy, thank you very much. We'll get back to you. Um, Anita Yao. Anita? Hello. Hi, this is Anita Yao the, uh, port, from Port of San Francisco, Wolfinger, and the harbor master for Asan to Fisherman's Wharf and uh, Hyde Street Harbor facility. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Ellis, Ellis Wallenberg. Oh, hi. This is Ellis Wallenberg. I'm the Director of Environmental Services for Weiss Associates, and we do work for the ports of San Francisco, Oakland, Redwood City, Richmond, uh, Stockton, and others. Very Environmental good. Engineering. Thank you very much, Ellis. Mr. Chapman, would you like to say hello? Hi, uh, my name is Mike Chapman, I'm affiliated with the Women's Pella Club, Port of the Golden Gate, also part of the um, International Pella Club of the United States. We support the Red Oak Victory, the Jeremiah O'Brien, and the um, California Maritime in giving scholarships to students. Very good, Mike, thank you very much. Kim Arive, how are you doing? Good morning. Hey, before I uh, continue, a point of order, maybe somebody doesn't have, they're making noise on their end, something's happening outside their picture. And they probably should mute their phone. Um, okay. If uh, okay. If uh, whoever's got their noise in the background would mute, I would appreciate it since we're going down the introductions. Okay. Go ahead. Arabic, uh, class of 68 deck, uh, Cal Maritime, went to sea. Uh, uh, went in the Navy, went to Vietnam, and a retired uh, Captain Merchant Marine and Captain USN. Uh, right now I'm retired and I just finished my tour on the Red Oak Victory in Richmond, which needs all the help it can get. <laughs> Thank you. Well, and, and we, need to, we need to get back to you on that, Kim, because we do need to give, do, I think we need to do something about that and help you out. Kim, are you still there? Yes, I am. That's okay. That's it for me. All righty. Thank you very much. Um, I see Dennis Dysinger. Dennis. Calling Dennis. Dennis, can you hear me? Okay. I'll, I'll come back to Dennis. Dennis is, I, I can, I, he's there, but. Uh, Dennis? Okay, Philip Martin. Hello. Philip, introduce yourself. I'm Phil Martin. I am a port commissioner from the Port of Peninsula, Washington State. Uh, our port basically supports the oyster and clam industry. And uh, I have been a part of this port for 25 years in various forms from tenant to commissioner. And uh, got in contact with you people through Anita Yao from the port of San Francisco. Very good. And, uh, well, thank you very much for joining and uh, we'll get back to you in our breakout session. Um, I see Alice. 
Alice Heron. Alice, are you there? Yep. Hi, my name is Alice Heron. I'm a founding principal of Golden State Renewable Energy. We're looking at uh, putting renewable and energy storage at uh, ports. Very good. Alice, thank you very much. Um, Bradley, did you introduce yourself to everybody? I went straight into policy, so I'll just uh, give a brief update on who I actually am. Uh, my name is Bradley Bottoms. I'm the Congressman Garamendi's chief of staff. Congressman Garamendi, as I mentioned, is currently the chair of the Readiness Subcommittee on Armed Services. Before that, he was the chair of the Maritime Subcommittee on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Um, he represents just north of Cal Maritime, starting in Solano County, about Green Valley area, all the way up to the Marysville area. I'm actually originally from Pacifica, so near many of you, but now unfortunately live out in Washington, D.C., where the view is not nearly as good. So thank you. Bradley, thank you very much. And we're going to come back to you for an uh, update on the shipbuilding uh, bill in just a second. Let me just finish the introduction. Um, I see Christopher Margaronis there. Mr. Margaronis, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, hearing about Kim's uh, sea adventure, uh, my father, Stas Margarona, sent me to sea at the age of 14 uh, in South America. So I, I put that on my resume. Um, it was a, a good parenting accolade uh, as well. But uh, in my day job, uh, I work for an infrastructure project finance company called Sperry Capital based in Sausalito. Uh, I'm their one and only Southern California member. Uh, we work on public-private partnerships, infrastructure financing on highways, trains, uh, water and energy. Thanks. Okay, Christopher, thank you very much. Uh, Evie Wong. Evie. Hello, Evie. everyone. I'm Evie Wong. I'm a customs broker working for Alba Wills Up. I'm currently president of the Customs Brokers Forwarders Association of Northern California. Um, pleasure to be here. I am uh, decided to wear my patriotic shirt. Uh, I have my invested in it years ago. I'm like, okay, when can I wear this? July 4th. <laughs> um, and um, uh, I, I have a few words for Mr. Bottoms that um, um, Mr. Garamendi is one of my heroes. Uh, we met him a couple of times. Uh, brokers and forwarders, we, we meet once a year in DC. Uh, it's called Mission to DC, Pacific Coast Council. And uh, I've had the pleasure of um, uh, Mr. Garamendi popping in into his office in between breaks and that. And uh, he does a lot of good work and in including locally that he has met with uh, customs, the port and just keeping his eye out for maritime. So I, I wish to extend my um, gratitude to Mr. Garamendi uh, and uh, what a pleasure to have uh, you joining our little meeting today. And I remember the last time you were actually with us, you were in my office, I couldn't join, unfortunately, but you're, I think, with our legislative director, Ian Hart, tall blonde gentleman. Oh, yeah, the yeah, yeah. Came in. I remember you in there well. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, well, great to see you. I, you I'm wondering if you you were the one I had a quick um, um, chat about the Howard Terminal um, um, something. So anyway, it's... We, we hope we'll be able to get back to DC next um, February or March, so. <laughs> we hope so too. Fingers, fingers crossed, yeah. Evie, thank you very much. Uh, I see Emily Sinclair. Emily, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Stas. Good morning, everyone. I'm Emily Sinclair in Corporate Communications and Government Affairs with Pesha Hawaii. We have a fleet of six cargo ships serving Hawaii, and uh, thank you, Stas, and thank you, Bradley, for joining us today. Thank you very much. I see Haishang Yang. Mr. Yang. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Haishang Yang. I'm the general manager for ZPMC for the Smart Solution Group. And uh, ZPMC actually is the, one of the big uh, clean manufacturer based in Shanghai, China. But uh, I was a GE engineer for West Coast for almost uh, 20 years for the clean business. So I'm glad to attend this meeting today. 
Uh, well, uh, hi, Sheng, thank you very much. Uh, for those of you who were not around two weeks ago, hi, Sheng and his team from ZPMC made a presentation about the cranes uh, that they, ZPMC is going to be delivering to the Port of Oakland and specifically to Oakland International Container Terminals. So uh, uh, hai Sheng is part of the uh, Harbor Automation Group and he discussed uh, systems integration with us and uh, we're hoping to have a ceremony on September 15th with uh, you and your colleagues, uh, Hai Shang, when the uh, cranes arrive. And, yeah, I got, uh, a new, I got a new schedule. The crane will arriving on the uh, September 12th. The new shipping oh, schedule, yeah. Oh, well, you, you heard <laughs> it here first. Yeah. Just in case SSA doesn't know about that. Thank you very much, Hai Shang. Uh, is did I miss anybody? Todd, is there anybody else I, I didn't get on the Todd, are you there? He's muted. I so. muted myself. Uh, right. I'm not sure if you got it. I think you got everybody. Okay. Uh, so Dean Oda, um, if you could start us off and give us a, a short update on what the situation is in Hawaii. I understand the state of Hawaii has done a very good job of controlling the coronavirus on the island. Uh, but the, uh, the other flip side is you don't have many tourists. So Dean uh, Oda, just for those of you who uh, came in late, uh, Dean is a freight forwarder uh, on the island, on the Hawaiian Islands. He's uh, located in Honolulu. He's an executive with H2O Transportation. And uh, Todd, if maybe you could mute everybody else so Dean can just walk by himself without any interference, I think that would be really helpful. And Dean, thank you very much, and you have the floor. Hey, hi, Stas. Thanks a lot. Um, hey, uh, I was um, my my background is uh, I started off in um, the container shipping industry with uh, a company called Sealand Service. Do you remember? Uh, yeah, Sealand, Sealand, which is which is now evolved into uh, Alpecia, which is uh, one of the two shipping companies that are servicing the Hawaiian Islands. But anyway, I just wanted to give you folks a brief snapshot of what's happening. Um, hey, Stas, can you hear me okay? I can. I can hear you fine. Oh, okay, great. Okay. Well, um, as you folks know, Hawaii is is highly dependent on on shipping. And approximately 90% of all goods that are that come to Hawaii uh, have to come in via one of two main carriers, which is Matson and Pesha uh, from from uh, California. Uh, because of the COVID-19 situation, uh, the the volume of containers coming to Hawaii is down. I would say approximately 20%. So I'm guessing right now there's about maybe. 5,000 or so containers that come to Hawaii on a weekly basis. So, you know, cumulatively between the carriers, maybe down about a, almost a thousand containers, which is pretty significant. Um, because tourism is the main industry in Hawaii, um, because of the COVID situation and because of uh, a state quarantine on visitors, um, our, our economy is basically tanked. And right now we went from we went from 35,000 visitors per day coming into Hawaii. We're down to about three to 400 visitors per day. And to make that worse, uh, when visitors come to Hawaii, there's a law now in Hawaii that each, every visitor has to quarantine for two weeks in their hotel room, meaning they need to go to the, straight to their hotel room and they can't even go out for food. They have to get food brought to them. They can't leave the premises. If they do leave the premises, they get they can get arrested, they can get fined five thousand bucks, and they'll probably get, get sent back to them wherever they came from. Okay, so that's 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 the situation now. Uh, um, what's happening now is on in order for us to restart our economy, we obviously need to get the tourists back in, but because of our strict quarantine laws, um, it's it's very difficult. Uh, so this is, is a catch-22 thing. So what the governor is going to do uh, on August 1st is they're going to allow tourists to take a COVID test 72 hours prior to boarding their flight. And if they do that and it's negative, then they don't have to quarantine. 
in Hawaii. Uh, if it's positive, obviously they're not going to let them in. Uh, and if it, uh, if they uh, if they come in here and they don't want to take the COVID test, then they have to do the two week quarantine. Okay. Uh, again, this this will take effect on August one. Hopefully, that will restart the economy or bring the tourists back in. Uh, as for the locals here, Hawaii is a very um, conservative society, and the locals here are are really really scared about COVID. Even though our numbers are, we're only doing about maybe we have maybe about average fifteen to twenty positive cases per day, which is not too bad considering what's going on elsewhere in the country. So, but you know, again, that's, that's what we need to do. And that's, that's the kind of problems we're facing here. Um, we, I'm not sure if you also are familiar with, uh, we have an inter-island uh, BART service called Young Brothers, uh, which is uh, uh, the only uh, company that handles inter-island commerce. So basically they ship mainly the cargo from Oahu to Maui, Big Island, uh, Kauai. And they're having some problems too, obviously because of the volume or the lack of volume from tourists. So uh, they're, they're trying to seek some, they're saying they're going downhill and they're trying to seek $25 million from the state of Hawaii to continue operating. Um, and they're trying to prove that, you know, they're trying to prove that, hey, um, uh, because of we are a PC regulated uh, company, that if they don't get the money, then we're going to stop all commerce going to all the neighbor islands. And that's, uh, uh, that's a big no-no in Hawaii because, you know, everybody, again, we're all dependent on shipping. Okay. Right. Um, basically, that's about it. I really, that's basically a snapshot of what's happening in Hawaii. Um, anybody, uh, uh, any questions? Yeah. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, uh, Todd, do you want to unmute everybody for a second and see if we have any questions? Sure. Hang on. Oops. By the way, uh, Kimberly, let me know that uh, uh, Natalie didn't get introduced, so we can do that afterwards. Absolutely. Thank you. Why is this? Should have hit and unmute all, and it's not working. All right. Hold I'll just on. do it. I'll just do it manually. All right. We're going to unmute everybody just to see if anybody has any questions. Or you can unmute yourself too if you know how to do that. Okay, I have a question. Um, who's going to get the Kapalama terminal? Uh, it's going to be Pisha. Oh, for sure. I, I knew Matson. I, I, I work for Matson out there. I train their oh. train operators on the new ZP and train. So yeah. uh. they're still building. I'm not sure when it's going to be completed. I, I, I think we have a Pisha person on, on the call, so maybe she can address that. Okay, thank you. Hi, um, this is Emily. I don't have the, the timeline right in front of me. Um, soon in the in the near future, but um, I can get I can get that that date. Well, there's plenty of freight to go around, so that's good. And uh, you know, Matson has their inner island service also. Yes, correct. I have a question. Yes. Why did uh, SAS Brothers stop their uh, ocean towing to Hawaii? Oh, that's, I'm, I'm not sure. That's a good question. Maybe, I'm assuming costs. Okay. Okay. Just curious. Hello, Stas? <laughs> You're muted, Stas. <laughs> Okay, you can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, uh, Natalie. Natalie, can you uh, introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Natalie. I interned for Anita at the Harbor office last summer, and my internship this summer got canceled because of COVID. So I reached out to Anita and she introduced me to Stoss. And so Natalie has been helping doing some outreach and Natalie, uh, we need to talk next week and uh, go over a schedule and thank you very much for the work that you did. Of course. Okay, and good luck finding work. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, okay, so Bradley, uh, can we get you back on for a second? I'm here. Very good. Okay, Bradley, uh, we have a uh, shipbuilding bill. Did you discuss that in your opening remarks? 
We did. Um, and we also talked about some of the new provisions in the National Defense Authorization on cargo preference for U.S. cargo providers. So um, I think we, we discussed questions on the infrastructure bill. There wasn't really much for energizing, though. I don't know if you have any questions, Stas. Um, so uh, if, if the, um, the infrastructure bill is $1.5 billion, trillion, right? Mm -hmm. That includes uh, 500 billion for highways, right? About that. Correct. Uh, as we get closer to the election, uh, where are we like? Uh, is something going to happen on this, or are we going to be waiting in suspense until November? It could go really either way. It depends the attitude of the American public. Unfortunately, I think we went into this with a pretty bipartisan want to do infrastructure. I think a lot of that is getting distracted for a very good reason with the COVID-19 uh, virus. But then again, when we get out of this, we're really going to need to look at job creation and job growth. So I think it's a better time than ever to do an infrastructure bill. Um, we'll see if that pans out. So Either I think this could be something that we do right before the election, get something similar to what the House passed, or it would have to wait until next year. All right. Um, and uh, the status on the shipbuilding bill is that we're, where are we with that? So we got really, really close for it to be included in the infrastructure bill. It had some, we call it germaneness issues, which is googly junk for the Committee of Jurisdiction one of the committees was not a part of this bill, the Foreign Affairs Committee, because it deals with the export of crude and LNG. So all of the chairs are now aware of this. We're hoping that if the House has to pass something like HR2 again, we might be able to latch it on, but it'll, the local propeller clubs can do a lot of work in helping us inform their members and make them on board and get them to co-sponsor the bill as well. Um, and that will help us out. But um, either that or we're, we're likely to do standalone hearings on the bill itself in the Energy and Commerce Committee, where it's primarily referred to. Bradley, one of the things that I've, uh, I've been a longtime supporter of American shipbuilding, why are we having so much trouble getting support for building U.S. ships? and then getting criticized by people who oppose the Jones Act because we don't have modern ships available to operate to places like Hawaii or uh, Puerto Rico or Alaska. I mean, what's with that? Well, it's a double-edged sword, and I know two people on this call can probably say better than me the sentiment in Hawaii and people seeing costs, but I think they don't necessarily recognize the importance to the local economy of the seafarers, the dock workers, everything like that that comes with American crews being on those ships. So um, I don't know if anyone else wants to take that up, but I know Mr. Case of Hawaii is certainly not a fan of the Jones Act. Uh, neither are some of the New York members who are of Puerto Rican descent. Well, that, and it's just in, too narrow of a view. That's and built two ships already. Um, some Sunship in back east and a Masco down south. They've got a third one on the you know on the way. They just scrapped the uh, uh, the Kauai, sent it around to Brownsville to be scrapped, which is good for us. We get the metal, and they'll be sending the uh, Matsonia, which is still over at Pier One in Alameda. They'll be sending it around shortly. So that's some good news, I think. Yeah, and I think there's some short-sightedness, and you you kind of addressed this a little bit, is we have all of this capability and we can do this. Um, people always point to it and say, look, the Jones Act doesn't work because the costs are too high. Part of that is it's not enough cargo. So really we can't do that many ships that we, the production lines at the shipyards are fast enough and have that capability because they're, they're doing these one-off designs. If we can get something like energizing in the pipeline, that's the name of our bill that we're talking about, these will be design specs and they can just keep moving, especially with the amount of work that we're slating from the Department of Defense after this last uh, National Defense Authorization Bill that passed last night. Okay, now I saw Ed Washburn show up here and Ed, uh, are you there? 
Yes, I am. Aha, funny you should be here. <laughs> uh, just for everybody, uh, Ed Washburn with Pesha Marine, uh, Pesha Group, and uh, he spoke to the Propeller Club a couple of weeks ago about the Jones Act and uh, the uh, uh, challenges that Pesha has with COVID. Ed, why are we having so many problems with the Jones Act? Well, um, of course, we're um, <clears throat> big supporters of the Jones Act. Um, I'm, I'm not sure we're having problems as we're having some bad information. Um, the Jones Act has invested billions into the economies in the last couple of years. As um, we just heard, Madison has invested in four ships that are over a billion dollars. Uh, they also invested in new cranes in Hawaii uh, and updating their terminal. We, um, we've invested in two new ships, which is a $500 million investment. Uh, we have a, a public-private partnership um, in Hawaii to create a new terminal, Kapalama Container Terminal, uh, which is a $400 million investment. Um, Crowley has invested in two new vessels to serve Puerto Rico, and that's upwards of another $500 million investment. Um, the construction of our two ships involves um, over 1,500 local workers in Texas, in Brownsville, Texas. Uh, and each one of those is uh, uh, an excellent livelihood, career, and it supports a family. So <clears throat> really we're supporting 1,500 families for three and a half years in construction of these vessels. And all of these um, new vessels are extremely environmentally sensitive. Um, they're all gonna operate on natural gas. Uh, the, the most advanced, uh, the most advanced um, hydrodynamically efficient vessels um, produced for, to carry cargo. Um, the advantage of the Jones Act is we have these investments. It's kind of a, a, a niche um, category where um, Puerto Rico, for instance, those ships are made just for Puerto Rico. So a, a foreign competitor um, may, may come in, but you know, the new ships like Crowley and Tocqueville are carrying 53 footers. Uh, that ship is not useful anywhere else. Uh, our new ship is designed specifically for the Hawaii trade with the number of reefers and the size and uh, of the containers. So our vessel is really not that useful for anywhere else. I think um, we continue to serve through hurricanes, through pandemics, um, through wars, of course, the Jones Act con continues to serve uh, the Mer U.S. Merchant Marine. And um, I don't think we'd get that dedication um, from foreign, um, foreign services going to the non-contiguous states. Um, they are welcome to come. Uh, they just can't bring cargo from the U.S. But uh, look, any ship can leave China and go to, and go to Honolulu. Um, but they don't because it's a, it's an expensive and it's a difficult operation to get into Honolulu. You can't, you can't leave 4,000 containers in Honolulu and go on your way. Honolulu cannot absorb that amount of containers. So the, the supply chain to Hawaii is really dedicated smaller ships with a constant supply of goods. Um, so those are all the good things that happen because of the Jones Act, uh, but we do get a lot of bad, a lot of bad press um, be, because there is an increased cost to meet U.S. regulations and for U.S. crew. Uh, but when you, the, the cost of the construction of ships, look, that's amortized over 40 years. Um, if you're carrying 75,000 containers a year, um, the cost of the ship really has no effect on on the cost of goods. Uh, so, Ed, let me ask you one question. Uh, the issue of marine highway shipping has been with us now for years, and uh, we've continued to have issues with congestion on, on the roads uh, going up and down the coast. Uh, is there a role for ships like yours to play in uh, uh, transporting containers that are offloaded at LA Long Beach that may be headed for Seattle, Tacoma, or Portland, or places like that? Um, I, I, think, I think there is. There's some, um, there's a couple um, 
couple logistics that are you have to get over the hump to make that happen. Um, I think the the there's a harbor freight tax that um, makes it somewhat prohibitive. You're paying tax in two harbors. Um, uh, the cost to load the box is um, is, is pretty expensive. Uh, but if you can get the quantity, then it certainly makes sense. And, and we're open to it. We, we, we do go from Oakland to LA. Um, typically that cargo in Oakland continues to Hawaii, but uh, there's no reason um, that, that some of that cargo can't get off and play. And some of it does for the most part. We are, we, we are always looking at the Marine Highway and seeing how we can participate in it. Um, yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, do I have any other questions on our uh, Jones Act or uh, domestic trades here while we have uh, our, uh, uh, we have Bradley and uh, uh, Ed here? Okay, uh, Ed, thank you very much for that. Um, now I'm going to uh, ask, uh, let me see if my son Christopher is there. Christopher, are you there? I'm here. Um, what is the situation? You're a consultant on transportation issues, and I was wondering um, if we don't get a highway bill soon here, are we going to start having problems in California with uh, our road construction? Uh, are, are we starting to have a little bit of a problem with not getting enough money for these projects? Yeah, I mean, you know, Dean mentioned the 20% drop in, in freight being delivered to Hawaii. And uh, a lot of the transportation agencies that handle your road maintenance that do any transit projects uh, rely on sales tax revenue or they have uh, fare box recovery. And granted, it's never that great, but both of those are heavily, heavily suppressed. And in California, uh, we have one other source of funds that generally helps uh, with some of our transportation funding, especially if it's green, and that's greenhouse gas uh, emission uh, cap and trade funds. Uh, and those are way, way down because there's less commerce occurring in the state. Uh, so uh, it's sort of a triple whammy. The governor's had to tighten the budget. So we do have a problem. And uh, right now, the likes of LA Metro and Muni uh, are really just focusing on projects that are already ready, uh, not future projects. Uh, they've essentially, you know, deprioritized any long-term projects that are in planning uh, so that they can allocate resources to projects that are already environmentally cleared. Um, touching briefly on California high-speed rail, uh, you know, they have uh, relied on cap and trade funds uh, along with uh, voter approved funds in Prop 1A uh, for a while, but cap and trade funds uh, are down, uh, and you know they're really banking on a democratic administration to give them the the boost that they need in order to you know meet any federal obligations that they have through their ARA grant agreement. Um, so, uh, in summary, it would be really really helpful uh, if a federal bill got passed. I know that you know Bradley was discussing HR two uh, and the highway bill. Uh, the highway bill will help, uh, but there is, uh, and Bradley's intimately familiar with this, you know, additional coronavirus emergency funding uh, for agencies uh, like transportation planning agencies is absolutely necessary. And they're not the only ones, uh, but, you know, they employ a large number of people. They manage our road maintenance uh, and it's a big, big issue. So I, I don't know uh, if there's light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, I have faith, but uh, I don't have any data to say that uh, we're in a great spot. Um, when we're looking at uh, transportation funding, we had in California passed a, um, an assessment a couple of years ago, a $50 billion assessment for highways. How is that going? That's going well. Um, the in my opinion, a majority of those projects are not your sort of uh, sexy, exciting projects that are, uh, you know, like a gondola from Dodger Stadium to Union Station or uh, a new Presidio Parkway uh, by the Golden Gate. Uh, but they're more uh, long overdue 
maintenance projects like bridges, uh, like, you know, uh, overpasses, uh, and just general highway maintenance. So that was really, really important. Uh, but it's hard for the everyday Californian to, to really see some of the impacts of that. Uh, if you drive to Nevada, Nevada has a really, really uh, great highway and road system, but they just have so many fewer lane miles than we do. And so we just have this constant, constant backlog of projects uh, that sort of make it hard to ever really catch up. And that was a good boost, but you know, there's still a ton of work to be done. Very good. Christopher, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Bradley, can I ask you, uh, one of the concerns that uh, some of us have raised uh, is if the corona situation continues um, and people do not have uh, extra unemployment uh, benefits and there's still a restriction on food stamps, is there likely that we can see something like more food stamp uh, uh, funding? Yes, I think that's very likely and, and essential. Obviously we passed, and Chris was talking to this, the HEROES Act, which we're waiting on the Senate to act on. And if they don't wanna act, it was a very bold piece of legislation. We think that this is a very bold time that we need things like that. Obviously FDR created the entire social security system when he had a great depression. We're in something that could be even worse than this. So we need to think boldly, but we're willing to, to work and broker. And we actually just last night passed a one month extension of the PPP program. We still had $150 million in that account. So, excuse me, billion dollars in that account um, that we wanted to grant out to small businesses. So we extended that and we're starting to see some indication that the Senate's taking this more seriously and that they will break up pieces of legislation and pass something more transformative. Also in that HEROES Act is one of the most important pieces is funding to the state governments. If we don't get that, we're gonna have some serious problems. It's gonna be in schools. Fortunately, it shouldn't impact transportation since all most of those dollars now are earmarked in California just for those goods. But in the past, we did a ton of that out of the general fund. And actually, I want to ask Chris, Chris, are you expecting to see a huge hit in our availability of funding due to people not commuting and the gas tax just not being as financially viable? Yeah, so we've done uh, some work for a few clients where uh, we've sort of scenario planned. Um, each agency is updating its forecasts on a, a monthly basis in their board meetings because it's so dynamic. Um, the month of April and May were really, really bad, uh, but we're already seeing, you know, preliminarily from the month of June that there was, uh, I think, an 85% recovery uh, in, uh, in travel, but that's not on uh, public agencies. That was just car travel. So people riding subway systems is still really, really suppressed. So uh, it's hard because a lot of these agencies, you model for a 20% drop, but you never model for a two month 80 or 90% drop. Uh, so a lot of programs and projects are being impacted. Uh, and, you know, we're going to really see where things lie in the next few weeks here. Well, and I can imagine that we may go back into that drop again with the governor, I think very needingly so, restricting 19% or 19 counties, which is about 75% of our population's movement and shutting down those businesses, I think are really going to impact the amount of vehicle miles driven and that revenue from the gas tax. Yeah, totally agree. I mean, you know, no one likes toll roads. Uh, and in LA, we have a, an express lane system that's fully funded. It's all revenue generating. There's no debt behind it, uh, but that's not the case in other places. Uh, so some of those are, are looking at uh, some financial impacts. Uh, and yeah, with the, the extended shutdown, uh, I think you're going to start seeing more and more furloughs coming down from state and local agency levels. Uh, they've been able to avoid those largely, uh, but there's going to be a trickle down impact where state and local government employees are going to be furloughed and then consulting dollars are going to get cut alongside that. So you're going to have a lot less uh, spending capacity in the economy locally. Uh, 
Bradley, one quick question. Uh, could you, uh, my daughter asked, what is PPP? Oh, absolutely. That's the uh, Paycheck Protection Program. So that was the, for small businesses can get a, a loan up to $10 million to keep employees on their, um, keep paying their employees, essentially keep them on payroll, keep them on health insurance as uh, shutdowns continue. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, okay, well, we have we didn't get into our breakout session because we've been talking so long. So uh, what I want to do is ask if anybody has any questions for Bradley. Anybody well, got? Any? I'm going to have to leave so I can listen to Governor Newsom. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> well, we'll miss you. Thank you very much, Kim. Take uh, care. You all, all right. Care. Okay, we have a question. Go ahead. Okay, yes, come over here and say it. Okay, Bradley Benita has a question and she's going to ask it directly. Um, I don't know if, it ha if you have any information on it, but I'm currently on, an, on unemployment um, and it's the only thing that's really keeping me afloat. Um, and the $600 extra that I'm getting because of this coronavirus is really making a difference. Um, and I know that most people's benefits at this point are either about to run up or have already run up. Um, do you know now that the likelihood of this being extended even further, do you know if they're going to come out with another stimulus package for everybody else? I've heard some talk about it, but I don't know if you know anything. You're talking Good about question. A and the United States Senate is your problem once again. It's a continuing theme on this call and most of my calls. Um, the HEROES Act included an extension of, uh, we call it the Pandemic Unemployment Insurance Program, um, PUA. So that bill has it. And once again, we're willing to take that out if the Senate take it out and do it as a separate bill if the Senate doesn't want to do that. But we think that obviously is critical, as I mentioned and Chris mentioned, the importance of keeping state and local governments whole or else they're going to start laying off their employees and then they will be not able to administer benefits. I don't know if you know this, but all unemployment claims have to go through the state of California and the state of yeah. California can't take on debt. So if we don't bolster them up, I, I'm sure you had a horrible time waiting for um, someone yeah. to answer the phone there. Yeah. Oh, it was horrible because they didn't have enough employees. It'll only get worse uh, if the state budget keeps falling down. So it's really the need for the federal government to take this hit on the deficit, which as a Democrat, it's a shocking thing to say, but compared to most of the Republican Party, I think I'm a deficit hawk at this point. But this is the time for deficit spending. Last four years, we probably should have been paying off the deficit. This is the time to spend a couple trillion dollars and we'll figure it out in a few years, because if not, we're going to have a much longer continued recession. Because I know that from at least my point is that I'm lucky enough to have parents who can support me if I mm -hmm. needed it. Um, but I know that finding a job is near impossible right now. I've spent the last two and a half months looking for a job and finally just gave up. Um, so I, I, I need, as most younger Americans and even older Americans need, we need that money to keep us afloat because we can't work. Yeah, and I totally understand that. I know, unfortunately, we haven't been able to figure out how to do our internship program remotely yet. Um, it's just such a physical necessity to be there. And that's really going to take away a generation of future congressional staffers because that's the pipeline to kind of grow. And I think it was Natalie or Natasha on the call is going through the same thing with internships. And obviously that's not full-time employment, but for a lot of people, it's a stepping stone that they need. And at this time, it really seems like if you weren't employed going into this, you're absolutely not going to be able to find something. And if you were, it's going to be difficult to change industries into something where remote work is, is, uh, Bradley, uh, we have, thank you, Benita. We have a, a, a further follow-up uh, 
on the uh, Coons bill reg regarding AmeriCorps and the expansion of AmeriCorps. And I know Congressman Garamendi was in the Peace Corps and uh, Benita and her colleague, who's my other intern, uh, Kevin, uh, would like to talk to you at a separate time about what you think about uh, AmeriCorps and public service and young people going in there. And will there be money to allow them to do that? Yeah, and uh, the congressman is the chair of the Peace Corps Caucus, actually. And he introduced, actually before Coons, it's called the Unite Act, which was almost the exact same thing, except it doesn't step up. It's an immediate buy-in. Um, we're very in favor of the Coons bill. It was just negotiated a little bit more and there's more step ups as they go. Ours just said the Corporation for National Service can hire 300,000 people and double their pay because we need that. We need the contact tracers. We need the individuals to deliver food so that way people with coronavirus aren't going out into the public. Um, obviously, I'm lucky I live in a city. If I had coronavirus, I could just do Uber Eats all day. Most people don't have that across the country. So um, he was actually a primary sponsor of exactly that bill. So if we would like to visit with you and my two interns at some point in the next week, if you have a few minutes on Zoom, could we do that maybe? Sure. Um, I probably can't do this week, but just shoot me an email and we can figure out a time. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, guys, we are coming to the end of our session and I want to thank Bradley very, very much for coming in when his boss was unavailable. Bradley, thank you very much. And well, thank you all. And it's always a great time to talk to all of you. And I know uh, our friends at Patria very well and good to meet a lot of new folks as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dean Oda. Dean, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Dean, um, uh, any last comments about the situation in Hawaii? Uh, no, it's just bored as hell staying home. That's about it. Okay, Dean, thank you very much. Um, uh, folks, we are uh, uh, hopeful we will have a speaker in two weeks, and uh, I'll get that out to you when we get there. Ed Washburn, thank you very much for coming in and addressing the issue of the Jones Act. <clears throat> Uh, we're also very interested in uh, the Marine Highway and uh, visiting with you at some future point about maybe building up our shipbuilding to accommodate that possibility. Do a thing. Okay. Uh, and uh, Leroy Zerlang. Leroy, are you still there? I'm still here, Stas. And uh, very quickly, uh, how is the economy in Hobart Bay? Well, we're... Um the boat yard end of it's very busy. We're busy with the with the boats. Our shipping is down to just about zero right now. Uh, the only thing that we export, we're not a seaport, we're a timber port. So the only thing that we've been exporting here for a couple of years is wood chips. And the Japanese market's in bad shape and the Chinese market's in bad shapes. So we haven't had any ships and a good year for us, you got to remember, is six, eight, ten ships. This year, so far, we haven't had any. We're doing a little bit of chip barge work. We've got one in port right now. Uh, we're hoping to have four chip ships come in this year. Um, so far, uh, we have a little problem with our entrance, of course. We're down to a draft limitation of 32 feet. We're working with the Corps of Engineers on that. Uh, future doesn't look too bright. Um, Humble County's doing fair with the virus. We have 136. We've been gaining about three every day. A few things that are working here that you know how you say that too is um, some are people are excited about it. Some people are very upset about it. Is we've got the cable project that's going. We got a research vessel offshore right now that is getting in trouble not be a political trouble um we got a fish farm coming the old pulp mill that's closed down has been leased out to nordic farms they're coming in with a fish farm which again is also very political with the commercial fishing fleet we don't know what's going on there and we're moving forward at a pr pretty good rate on the wind energy the offshore wind energy so those are three of the positive things that's going on. Other than that, we're um, 
other than that, we're pretty slow. We don't really have nothing going on. We've got our tugs here. They're sitting at the dock. Um, we're hoping for a good end of the year, but right now we're we're not looking too promising. Our harbor cruise boat, of course, is tied up to the dock. Tourism is down to nothing. Our crab season was poor. Uh, salmon looks a little bit hopeful, maybe, maybe, maybe a little bit hopeful there. Uh, we thought we lost our drag boats there for a while, but uh, uh, they're picking up again. People are starting to eat fish instead of beef and pork and chicken. So that's coming around a little bit. Our oyster companies are in trouble. Uh, I mean, Coast Seafood, uh, the biggest one that we have here, they're, they're owned by Pacific Choice, so they're financially healthy, but it's nobody's buying oysters. Restaurants aren't buying oysters. Our four little oyster companies are definitely struggling right now to stay alive. Uh, we're praying for an end of the virus and hopefully get back to work. Very good. Leroy, very, <laughs> I, I hope things turn around for you guys and uh, best of luck. Uh, you, I know you run the finest boat yard uh, in uh, <laughs> northern, northern California and good luck with that. I know you've worked really hard on that and, and you've done a really great job helping those fishermen uh, get their boats repaired in, into the water. So Yeah, we're working. That's, that's going real good. I mean, we're not getting the big, uh, big expensive jobs, but everybody's doing their maintenance. And we're praying for everything, including a good crab season. So, All righty. You take care. Thank you very much, Leroy. Yeah, thank you, guys. It was a pleasure. Okay. Uh, so uh, I want to tell, say all to all of you, many of you in the maritime industry, um, uh, we continue to hope that things will get better. You've heard some uh, reports from a variety of our uh, participants today. Uh, we can only work at what we can do. And I want to thank all of you uh, for all of the good work that you're doing by the sea, by the waterfront, um, moving cargo, uh, keeping this country uh, operational. And I want to thank Bradley and Congressman Garamendi. Uh, Christopher, thank you very much for your excellent update on the highway and transportation infrastructure situation. Uh, Dean, we hope things will get better in Hawaii. We know that it's going to be really tough if no tourists show up anytime soon. Um, so we will keep our fingers crossed. Uh, but as uh, Bradley said, action from Congress would really, really make a difference. If we can get money into the system for food stamps, for Benita's unemployment, uh, for transportation and infrastructure, things will not be as bad as they are. So with that, I want to thank you all for your time. Uh, uh, Sheng Yang, thank you very much for coming from ZPMC. We look forward to the cranes coming to uh, uh, Hawaii, to uh, Oakland on the 12th. And uh, thank you all for your time. Have a good 4th of July. Thank you again for your service. And we will see you soon. Bless you all. Thanks Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Stan. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. Very